and good afternoon everyone uh, my apologies for not being able to to be there with you today uh, due to personal circumstances <clears throat> um yeah so what i want to talk to you about today is as nula said um uh, the UK experience with uh, pine weevil and pine weevil management. Um, I want to start off by talking a little bit about plant protection and uh, uh, recent developments. Uh, also talk about guidance that we currently have out. A little bit about uh, monitoring and integrated population management and finish off with um, where we are in relation to control. So... <clears throat> Uh, first slide here, just a quick intro to forest research, really. Forest research is the research agency of the Forestry Commission, which I'm sure many of you are, are aware, uh, and UK's principal organisation for forestry and tree-related research. Um, and we do uh, and provide a lot of uh, science uh, and research evidence um, for the industry as well as data and services in support of sustainable forestry. Uh, a little bit of background about uh, pine, um, pine weevil. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure it's the most serious pest of young conifer trees um, across most of Northern Europe on restock sites. It kills all species of newly planted trees. Of course, we're probably <clears throat> more interested in conifers than anything else, but it does damage broadleaves too. And we've estimated that the annual UK impact in terms of uh, damage um, done by the pest is estimated as about £7 million in terms of its direct impact. But when you take into account things like delayed revenue and other things as well, it can amount to as much as £40 million per annum. Um, in terms of the uh, <clears throat> sort of historical black background to uh, plant protection, um, <clears throat> historically we've uh, prevented a lot of the damage through spraying with synthetic pyrethroid insecticides, uh, pyreth uh, permethrin, alpha cypermethrin, cypermethrin, um, and as you'll all know, those are applied to the stems of young trees. Uh, either in horticultural nurseries or in, uh, in industrial buildings or in top-up spraying of individual trees uh, in the forest, as you can see in the picture on your left there. Uh, however, there's been a lot of concerns over the toxicology, the toxicity of uh, cypermethrin to aquatic life, especially in uh, the last few years. It's a priority substance in the Water Framework Directive um, and uh, as a result of that, voluntary uh, certification schemes, uh, forestry certification schemes actually discourage its use now. Um, <clears throat> due to the pressure to move away from using pyrethroids, the public and private sector joined forces um, in 2009 um, in a collaborative effort to find alternatives. Um, we set up a huge number of trials um, and established those between 2009 and 2015 um, with 30 experiments um, uh, with more than 100 different treatments um, and looked at a wide range of alternative methods of protection to see how well they worked uh, against uh, hylobius damage. Um, I particularly want to draw your attention to two key publications that we produced from that work quite recently. Well, I produced these with my colleague, Ian Willoughby. He's not an entomologist as such, but he has an awful lot of experience in using um, and advising on the use of pesticides and herbicides in, in forestry. So this is the first publication that we produced. Um, are there viable chemicals? chemical and non-chemical alternatives to the use of conventional insecticides. And in this paper, um, we've used multiple natural product insecticides, repellents, bioinsecticides, and flexible coatings. They've all been 
tested, but they, we found them to be largely ineffective. Uh, some of the techniques that have been reported as effective in Scandinavia, for example, Coniflex didn't work reliably in the UK. Uh, and it's thought that that's partly due to the larger hylobius population sizes that we have in the UK. And I suspect that would be a similar situation in Ireland as well. Um, some of the physical barriers can work in the UK, but we found that that was probably only the case if they were used on um, sites where the hylobius populations were low and the damage pressure correspondingly, cor correspondingly was low. Um, and that if you were going to use physical barriers, that could only they could only really be used as part of an integrated approach, uh, for example, with suitable stock types, ground prep, weeding, and uh, on sheltered sites. The link to the paper is shown here, and it's a freely downloadable paper. So that's the first of the two papers that I wanted to draw to your attention. Uh, the second of those two key papers, based on that very large piece of work, was this one where we focused predominantly on acetamiprid and chlorantranilipril uh, and physical barriers like multipro and KVAA um, wax. Uh, and what we found from the results was that um, the insecticides acetamiprid and chlorantranilipril were very effective. Uh, and were good alternatives to the synthetic pyrethroids. They provided equally level, good levels of, of uh, plant protection. Uh, Chloram tranilipril um, has relatively low toxicity as a non-neonicotinoid, which makes it actually quite an attractive proposition, but unfortunately it's not currently approved. So most of the um, plant protection currently is using uh, acetamiprid. Again, a link to the paper is shown here. Uh, and there's another paper that isn't freely available that was produced by um, <clears throat> some of the private sector um, workers that we were working with on our papers as well. Um, so I just thought I'd draw that to your, to your attention as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, I also wanted to draw your attention to this updated um, IPM guide. I say updated because it's been available for quite a number of years now, um, but we have updated it in response to the key findings of those latest um, research trials into alternative approaches. It gives detailed pra detail practical guidance on how to prevent hylobius damage to young trees. It uh, sort of details how to adopt an integrated approach and we certainly recommend an integrated approach where that is feasible for you. Um, it helps you understand the hylobius life cycle, consider the impacts of the insect and the full range of potential approaches that you can use, um, uh, either alone or in combination. Uh, and the overall take home message is that pesticides should only be used as a last resort. That said, we do recognize that uh, pesticides are still a really important um, tool in the approach to uh, hylobius control. Well, the guide covers non-chemical and chemical approaches and integrating the two. It summarizes the relative costs, efficacy of the different techniques and the potential risks of those different options. And it helps managers to meet the requirements of SS, FSC certification. Um, and once again, that's freely available to download off the FR website, and there's a link there to, for you to get, get access to that. Um, I've already really been through most of the, or a lot of the conclusions, um, but uh, one of the things that was recognised as a result of the research that we did need to do an awful lot more on non-chemical approaches, including biological control, um, that might work on sites even with the highest population pressure. So, so we're controlling the population rather than just uh, putting something on the plant that protects plants without controlling the population. <coughs> uh, and about three years ago, um, we were presented with a bit of a new challenge 
uh, as there was a new funding initiative was announced by Forestry and Land Scotland. Uh, a small business research initiative uh, funding stream became available. Um, and the sort of um, background to that was that uh, it was looking to find a solution to Hylobius in Scottish forestry. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is going a bit here. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so essentially trying to find cost effective establishment mechanisms um, and reducing uh, mortality from damage caused by the insect. As a result of that, um, I formed a technical and commercial consortium um, with partners uh, to participate in, in the Can Do Innovation Challenge Fund initiative. Uh, and the partners that um, uh, we joined up with were University of Greenwich, who have a lot of experience in developing pheromone lures, uh, and uh, our industrial partner was Sentinel, um, who produce a lot of um, pheromone traps um, for um, distribution to both the forestry and agriculture, agricultural sector. <clears throat> so this is the project team. Um, won't dwell on that too much, but I thought it would be sensible to introduce you to the um, commercial director of Sentinel, David Lachlan, and um, Professor David Hall, who leads a team at um, Natural Resources Institute of the University of Greenwich. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is going. Um, so what I'd like to talk about now is our Hylopod system that the three consortium members um, have developed during the course of that SBRI Can Do funding initiative. Um, the Hylopod system that we've developed offers really what's an entirely new approach to integrated monitoring and control of uh, the weevil. Um, and it's a complete population monitoring system offering site-specific monitoring of Hylobius populations and of Hylobius risk uh, and specific site management decision support. Uh, and in the future, we hope to uh, incorporate outbreak control methods within the trap uh, for local and forest-wide population reduction. Um, the system can link and does link with the existing Hylobius management support system, which I'll describe a little bit about in a second about that. Uh, and the system will offer a range of continually evolving solutions and tools for Hylobius management and provides a platform for any emerging and new biocontrol agents. Um, and it is a system of component parts, really, uh, a trap body, uh, a lure, contained within the body, a camera system, um, and as I say, we can add biological control agents to that. Uh, a little bit about the, the component parts of the system. Uh, we've developed a Hylobius lure, which is a unique blend of chemicals identified from host plants that are highly attractive to Hylobius. Um, and we well, NRI have done that work um, and it's involved a lot of detailed analysis, um, collection of volatiles, gas chrom chromatography linked to mass spectrometry uh, and also electrophysiology. You can see here uh, a picture of a weevil antenna um, with um, an electrode being put into the antenna to, um, to detect responses to um, key component chemicals that we were testing at the time. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that unique lure, we've also developed dispensers to deliver the lure. Um, and those dispensers release the volatiles over a required period of time to retain attraction in the field and release at an op the volatiles at an optimum rate for weevil detection. Um, the second component of the Hylopod monitoring trap is the monitoring trap itself. Uh, the whole system is, has been developed really to replace billet traps, which are heavy 
costly uh, and their attractiveness is very short lived for those of you who have ever put billet traps out. They probably only last for around about four weeks in terms of their full effectiveness. Um, the Hylopod monitoring trap can, well, there's, there's basically two monitoring traps that we have. There's a Hylopod M, that, which um, attracts and retrains, retains weevils for manual counting and verification. And there's a Hylopod RS, which is a remote sensing version of the trap, which sends images of captured weevils to a central facility um, to aid with analysis uh, and verification. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, that's one of the images of weevils caught in the trap in the field. Uh, and the image is sent back to our central servers. The imaging system was developed with our partners at uh, Census, um, who we've been commissioning to carry out the work for us. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so the data interpretation of the Hylopod data um, that is collected will be through the HMSS, Hylobius Management Support System. The HMSS is basically a decision support system that helps foresters plan their restocking strategies uh, to help them minimize future transplant damage and restock failure. Um, and it helps uh, avoid unnecessary insecticide use um, and helps reduce costs due to the insect. The Hylopod M and the RS traps both provide Hylobius count and site data that can integrate directly with the HMSS. The HMSS then predicts damage to transplants on clear fells in both pre and post restocking periods um, for only a, a period of monitoring of just five weeks. We can set the systems up so that they provide a longer period of weevil trapping and detection if required. Um, and where we do that with more regular monitoring, it does enable short term reactive management. For example, if you want to see um, when you need really to go out and do insecticide top up sprays in the field. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> um, so how will the um, Hylopod data be used actually in the Hylobius management support system? So the Hylobius data is manually or remotely sensed um, and uploaded to the HMSS, depending on which Hylopod version you've got. Um, and it's uploaded via storage um, and mobile API. Uh, the counts are then converted to population density uh, because we can convert counts to population density because of detailed population work that we've done in the past. Um, and we can predict that population density into the future using pre-existing um, Hylobius management uh, support system models. Um, and they can be mapped, as you can see here. Uh, and we can map those on a variety of scales, either uh, on a site-specific basis, or as you can see here, um, forest-wide mapping of those population densities. And I'll just run through a, a sequence here, which shows you um, how the populations from particular point sources um, from Hylopod count can be mapped uh, and also how they vary across the, um, of the forest for a period from 2018 to 2023. So you'll see how these hotspots of Hylobius populations change over time. This is for the same area, I should say. So 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. So how do we use that population data? Well, uh, here's how we convert those population densities. They're also converted to predicted future restock losses. So from that perspective, they help you plan in a lot for the long over the longer term. Um, and they enable you to interactively investigate the site-specific risk associated with different um, future restock strategies that you might employ. Um, the key outputs from the HMSS can then be exported 
to these planning tools to allow you to do that. So again, I'll, I'll run through a quick sequence here. Uh, and what you can see here is how, as a forest manager, you might alter your restocking strategy to see how that will impact on the levels of damage that you'll see um, at a particular site. Um, and what you'll see here is that we've adopted a standard treatment and then we can see visually how that will um, impact the levels of damage. For example, here, we've chosen losses of untreated trees with a two year fallow. Uh, and these figures here are estimating the levels of damage um, for each of those sites if you adopt that strategy. The next one here shows <clears throat> if we adopt um, a strategy of using pre-treated trees with a two year fallow, and the next one is losses of untreated trees with a four year fallow. So you can see how it impacts the losses that you're likely to incur at those sites. So advanced prediction really. Um, so in addition to the hylopod being used for monitoring purposes and predicting into the future, um, what we're hoping to do in addition to that is offer a biocontrol approach um, and I thought I'd just quickly run through the current uh, biocontrol uh, approach that's used by the industry and also how we envisage the hylopod um, changing our future um, uh, biocontrol strategies. Now, this is a traditional application of nematodes that is used in parts of the UK and it's still used now, uh, predominantly in Wales at the moment. This is where entomopathogenic nematodes, which are convert, uh, commercially available biological control agents, can be used to target larval populations of hylobius found around stumps. Uh, basically, we've got lots of operators here following around um, a harvester, which is rigged up uh, with a nematode solution, um, and then individual operators are um, spraying the stumps and the nematodes are then getting access to the larvae and the stumps and killing those larvae. Uh, there's obviously a lot of problems with that approach and limitations to its use. Steep ground, soft ground, sorry, steep slope, soft ground, old brash mats don't always support the rigs. You find they get bogged down um, and it requires large volumes of water, um, huge block sizes to be economically uh, worth doing. Uh, and we found through experience that this system seems to be less effective on sites in the north where populations tend to be higher. So uh, bearing all that in mind in terms of the hylopod system and our lure and kill strategy that we'll be incorporating in our new system, um, what we'll be doing is targeting adult hylobius weevils rather than the larvae, uh, attracting them to discrete mini hylopods um, where we intend to infect them with nematodes or fungal agents. The infected weevils are then free to leave the mini pods and the aim is for them to infect other weevils on site uh, before they die themselves. Um, with the aim of reducing weevil mating, lowering egg and larval numbers, and driving down the next generation um, in the forest. Um, current studies use, uh, that we've carried out have used commercially available nematodes, which don't require registration, but we've also demonstrated that um, both entomopathogenic nematodes and fungi can kill adult pylobius. Um, and can be distributed with a hylopod system. Obviously, fungi will require um, registration, even though the nematodes don't. The way we envisage these systems working is laid out here. Um, our mini pods delivering um, the biological control agents distributed around the site, and they would be combined with a small number of hylopod RS units as both dual function bio de control delivery uh, devices and monitoring devices, providing a measure of insect visits to treatment stations 
and the effectiveness of that biocontrol strategy. Um, so there's a sort of list of achievements uh, under the S SBRI Can Do project. Um, in terms of, you know, we've identified compounds from Scots pine and Sitka spruce that are highly attractive to hylobius. Um, and we've produced an artificial blend. Uh, we've got now controlled release dispensers for the blend that have been developed. Uh, there are more attractive than uh, twigs. They can last for over two months in the field and can catch as many hylobius as the standard billet trap. Um, we believe we can increase the period over which those lures are attractive for, and we're working on that this year. Um, we know now that the hylobius uh, hylopod system traps give good hylobius captures when used in the monitoring mode, and even better in our lure and kill mode. The hylopod pod system catches very low numbers of non-target invertebrates, which is uh, you know, really good to know that uh, that is the case, because uh, obviously we don't want uh, non-target invertebrates if we can help it being infected by our biological control agents. Um, we know that the hylobius counts now can be integrated with the HMSS for site-specific advice from the time of monitoring to five years post-monitoring. Um, and we found that formulations of both nematodes and fungi um, gave very high weevil mortality in the lab. And the ability of both to infect adult weevils in the field has also been demonstrated during the course of the project. Um, when delivered, the nematode um, have been delivered of the uh, hylopod system. That's probably getting to, oops, gone the wrong way there. <clears throat> so, yeah, if anybody is interested in either the Hylobius Management Support System or the Hylopod System, um, which we're expecting to offer um, in 2023, these are my contact details and I'll be very pleased to hear from you. Um, that's the end of my presentation and I should hand back at that point, I think, to Tanula. Thank you. Okay, Roger, thank you very much for that. A lot of really in interesting research taking place there. Um, in relation to the hylopod, is, I see there you're expecting that it would be available in 2023. Is this the lure and kill one or is it the manual or which one? At the moment, it's uh, it'll be the manual system. The biocontrol lure and kill system is going to take a little bit longer to develop. Um, and we're still actively doing the research that we need to do to deliver that option at a later stage. We'd like to think that we'll be in a position within one to two years to offer that system, uh, but we're certainly a little bit off, a little way off with that yet. For the, um, uh, the monitoring, uh, relatively low numbers, uh, if we're doing a monitoring for the, with the intended uh, use of the management support system, then it would be as few as 24 um, spread across the site. Um, if we're uh, looking to providing um, uh, regular advice through the year so that you can make decisions on insecticide use, that would need to be much more um, uh, widely distributed because of what we know about uh, population densities across sites. So we'd envisage probably one per hectare. Have you incorporated or considered incorporated uh, results from stump hacking into your agenda? Uh, stump hacking? No, I, I haven't. Um, potentially we could, but it would be uh, quite a bit of additional work to do that. It's not something that we could do overnight. Um, I mean, what, what we've tended to find in the past um, when we've been doing that, our own research is that the variability in terms of populations within a stump is actually quite large and you have to invest quite a large amount of effort to, um, to do those stump dissections. So we haven't really um, advocated doing them in the past because when we monitor with traps, we're not just monitoring the population um, within 
an individual stump. What we're essentially getting is, a, is weevils coming in from a, a number of stumps. So we, we find that we get a better average for populations by doing that. Just in terms of the, your monitoring and the, the estimates you had from your model, are they all based on using a fallow period of between two and four years? No, no. Um, I just illustrated um, three different um, strategies that could be um, input to the system to investigate what their impacts would be. Uh, in reality, there's an awful lot of different management strategies that you can adopt using the, um, the management support system. And I could have equally showed those uh, in the presentation. Yeah, so you, you could opt not to do any kind of fallow period. Um, and, you know, in, in the year after monitoring, you could just put out um, <clears throat> the trees on, on the site um, and they could be treated trees and you could apply um, the maximum number of um, recommended, sorry, the maximum number of top up sprays that you were allowed and we can still predict the, predict the damage that you'd incur as a result of that. Very flexible, the high level management support system in that regard. Roger, my question is on the hylopod. What's the effect of time on the trap and kill? If you put it out on site, what's the amount of time that it can be left on site for that it'll be effective? And how long, how many times will it need to be topped up with the pheromone? Uh, the f um, yeah, the, the, yeah it, it's, it's not specifically a, a pheromone as such, although we're still trying to develop those as well, but or find those. Um, no, it's, just, it's an attractant uh, composition um, based on the, um, the food source. Um, at the moment, that lure needs to re be replaced every two months, um, or we're recommending that it's replaced every two months. It does last a little bit longer than that. But this year, we're doing uh, trials where we alter the composition with a higher concentration of lure in so that we can investigate you know, how much longer the lure will last for. And we're sure it will last for longer. It's just that we haven't, um, we haven't fully finished that work off yet. We have something that knows, we know works for two months.